planet. Now, very quickly before I go on, I do want to bring up certain practices that are associated with this model, even though they're not intrinsically built in, but they do have a relevance. For example, food accessibility. Right now, everyone has a kitchen in their home, and they tend to eat in. In fact, it's a staple of saving money to eat in. But you tend to find that the culture prefers, at least in many areas, to eat out. To eat out is, in fact, from a structural standpoint, much more efficient than to cook food yourself. To make food in mass is always more efficient than to make food as an individual. So the restaurant going phenomenon will carry over, except it will actually be an efficient practice, and it will not cost money. It will actually save energy and save food resources and eliminate waste for people to actually go to community-oriented eating areas or so-called restaurants. So distribution, in summary, I've jumped around a little bit here, is through a checkout system, a delivery system, or simply an acquisition system. And it's made available, it's tracked, the abundance is allocated, and again, the basis is on the intelligent usage of these goods, just like the intelligent management of the materials that can, the goods consist of, whether it's in the form of eating at a restaurant that is making food in mass, or it's in the form of not saving things that you don't actually use every day, and you return them to facilities where other people can have access to it. And by the way, a lot of people, when they hear stuff like that, they imagine going to a distribution center and getting some beaten up, broken thing, and, and they, can't, they have to make do with it. No. Things are designed to last. Things are designed to work. Anything that doesn't work is updated and fixed on a constant basis. Uh, it's a very different paradigm. You know, we, we really have to remember that every attempt at any form of centralized system has always worked within the monetary system one way or another and always had to cut corners to produce anything. And of course, there's very few real centralized systems that have ever occurred in history. So it, you're getting the best. The best is all that's created. The highest efficient, best, most strategically created products are all that's ever created. So keep that in mind when evaluating these ideas. And again, and I can't reiterate this enough, it is through these preservation and strategic processes that will create an abundance for all the world's people. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there about the Zeitgeist Movement, the Venus Project, and a resource-based economy regarding the promotion of abundance because they don't understand what the mechanisms are that will alleviate the pressures we have in the current system to allow for an actual abundance. What we see today is only a fragment of what could occur if strategic management is put in place as far as accessibility, as far as, of course, energy and the advanced mo models for creating renewable systems approach energy, which can reduce intermittency, which can harness supercapacitors. There's a whole string of technological advents that can be talked about, but that's not the subject of this conversation. But suffice to say, it is through preservation and strategic use that an abundance, an accessible abundance will be created for the world's people so everyone can live a healthy life and a high quality of living, reducing all types of conflict and mental neuroses, psychological neuroses, and all the structural violence of poverty and everything else, and I won't even go on that tangent. Moving forward, the next level, as I've already alluded to, is recycling protocols and updates. When you buy a computer console, uh, you don't just throw the whole thing away when it becomes obsolete. Companies do not manufacture them, so they're complicated enough where you need to take it in somewhere to get replacement parts. You have an interchangeable system, just like with an automobile, as Jacques would always reference, you would simply pull out the engine. You could put a replacement engine in, lock and load things like this in the event servicing was required. You make it as efficient and easy as possible. You want interchangeable parts. You want universal components. Uh, very much, re excuse me, recently they came out with a universal phone charger, if I remember correctly. Why don't we do this with everything? Of course, the capitalists will argue that it reduces competition and innovation. That's complete 
nonsense, as I've already denoted. Uh, if people want to be motivated to have the best, they will work to create it not only for themselves, but for everyone else in society. So updating goods and recycling. Everything is designed to break down correctly. And with the least amount of extended breakdown and the least amount of polluting attributes, uh, we move to decomposable materials, not materials that are simply inexpensive to produce that sit in landfills for thousands of years because they can't decompose. I think you get the train of thought here. It, again, it becomes quite self-evident on a per-case basis. Now, with those general attributes described, and I hope that's been relatively clear, we can talk about labor and the placement of labor within this economic system. In a certain sense, labor isn't related to, quote, the economic model at all, because the economic model is completely physical. Labor is sort of an assumption that's made, which basically will be done intrinsically by automation because of the technical processes and the elimination of all of the excess jobs that don't fulfill any type of social role. Does that mean that there isn't a need for people to do something? Obviously, people will be doing lots of things. Most of them will be working to engineer, to create better efficiency, to create better goods, to take new technologies and apply them for the betterment of everyone. And this will happen. I, I really, I, it's really sad to see the conditioning in this culture where everyone just they literally lose motivation when they don't have monetary gain because of what's been created. They become aberrated. They get home from work and they don't want to do anything because they, they, just, they, they don't gain anything from their work. They have a high stress level, the stress level of my, losing their job, of the general temperament of the people they work with who are also in fear of losing their job and things of such. Uh, you can see why the psychology is what it is and why many people who hear this system, they say, oh, well, if I don't get paid for something, I'm certainly not going to work. Well, in many cases, that's, that's true for them because they've been aberrated into that psychology. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way, and that's an unfortunate thing. We have to undo what the monetary system has done uh, on that level, and it's um, you know, it, it's a difficult thing. It's a very difficult value system attribute to overcome. But contribution to this system, once this type of efficiency mechanism is put in place, and I'm going to keep saying that word over and over again as an economic uh, systems variable component because I do think it's a very important uh, consideration, uh, the amount of human labor required to maintain the system is actually very limited on a mechanical level. You'll have oversight of the factories that are producing goods through robotics and mechanization, which we have vast capabilities of. Cybernation of the industrial complex is going to happen one way or another, and I'm not going to talk about technological unemployment beyond the fact that it's very, very clear during this economic downturn that every major, major sector is moving to uh, technological um, application, excuse me, mechanization, because they see the efficiency of it. They see the need to downsize. Everyone is struggling in this system. Well, except basic Wall Street, but then again, what do you expect? I mean, all the money that was thrown in for the bailouts all went to the wealthy elements of society, the investment community, and that's all that money was basically for us. So I, I love the fact that you have unemployment continuing its slide, efficiency continuing its slide, uh, and all the other barometers of true economic health, if you will, continuing its slide in this country, yet the stock market continues to go up. If anyone hasn't figured this out yet, uh, it's utterly laughable, the uh, illusion. So anyway, that's an aside. So this model is based on deliberate mechanization of labor. And not only is that intrinsically important from the standpoint of reducing human stress and the basic human well-being, it is also provably more efficient than human labor. And that's the thing that I pointed out in numerous lectures. Uh, the more mechanization has increased, the more efficiency has increased. The more unemployment has increased, the more efficiency has increased, meaning technological unemployment. Uh, the more, I'll put it this way, the more employment drops in a given sector, the higher the efficiency is due to the application of technology. I'm referring to technological unemployment most of all. 
So that, again, becomes self-evident. So it is literally illogical and impractical for us not to apply mechanization to reach an optimum state of production. So that's a given as well. It's not an opinion. That is what the trends have foreshadowed. And uh, we should lock on to this and love it for the emergence of what it actually means to the change of human society and what it means for an elevation of human beings. Uh, it's just profound to think what could happen if we actually move forward with this direction from just the quality of life. Um, actually, wait a minute. I almost forgot, in fact. Uh, technological unemployment is not going to stop, as I mentioned. Mechanization is going to continue for the sake of profitability of corporations. However, what isn't discussed as these corporations do this is that they're displacing people, they're reducing purchasing power in every community, which means there's less money for people to go out and buy the goods that they're making through the mechanization. So it is a self-destructing phenomenon. It is one of those things that occurs in entropy, if you will, that is unstoppable. And it simply proves the false nature and the fact that this system has run its course. And it's that simple. It is outdated by the uh, advent and development of modern science, technology, and just the phenomenon of human evolution and development itself. And that's that. So. I've gone through the basic attributes of this economic model in a very logical way. I haven't been too quantitative about it, but when I do create the knowledge base entry, I'll try to be much more extensive. Um, I was actually hoping to be more extensive in this presentation, but I'm unfortunately strapped for time. And frankly, I think really if you understand what I just expressed, uh, which is really just the tip of the iceberg as far as the overall specifics, as you might imagine. I didn't even go into the central computer database. I didn't even go into the mechanisms, specific mechanisms of assessment when it comes to evaluating, say, energy uh, and what to use. And, but then again, the efficiency mechanism, if applied, shows the self-evident nature based on the general goal of maintaining a sustainable world. It doesn't take voting. It doesn't take human opinion. It doesn't take even a government of any accord to understand this. Human behavior is, of course, a problem. As, uh, as easy to see that we've become very distraught as a species and very suspicious of each other. But that's an entirely different cultural problem. And that has nothing to do with the behavior of the economic system from the standpoint of sustainability. So while this might seem like an abstraction to many people, and everyone says, well, what about the use of uh, terrorism? Or what about fear of security? Or what about you know all these things that could come into play? Those are temporal cultural attributes, OK? That's it. Those are not real. What I just discussed is actually real in the sense that it has the most longevity. The cultural problems we have are secondary. And uh, we have a long ride to overcome the cultural issues. I, I absolutely agree with that. But that doesn't change the way society should be governed in the most sustainable and efficient manner. And I hope uh, the train of thought here was followed. And I will be back next Wednesday to talk about what I think I called the profile of collapse and understanding the attributes of the coming and, well, the growing economic crisis, which I think will probably collapse in a series of tiers. But uh, we can talk about that uh, next week. All right, everybody. Take care.